Hello everyone, I'm Professor Paul Carrier and uh, it is time to talk about Class 3 of Contracts 1. Let's remind ourselves where we are. We're in the first part of Contracts 1, the first seven weeks on contract formation. And as you recall, contract formation requires four elements and those four elements have components exceptions, etc. within them. We are in formation in week three. Week one was offer. Week two, we began acceptance. Week three, today, is more acceptance. And in fact, week four is also acceptance. It will not be until week five that we move into the third element of contract formation. As you recall from last time, like an offer, an acceptance has to have a current intent. I'll think about it is not good enough. I'll take it. Here's the money. That is good enough. And that intent, the current intent, is judged with the same basic standard as the current intent of an offer, an objective standard. Not what the offeree is object, uh, subjectively thinking in his or her mind, but how it would appear under the facts and circumstances surrounding the purported acceptance. Okay, The acceptance also needs to be communicated. If the offeror does not know of an acceptance, then the offer may be open to other parties who may accept. Okay, So without communication of some form, of an appropriate form, there is no acceptance. By the way, a significant amount of today's materials will focus on the acceptance's communication component. Okay, And the third element, as you recall, with an offer, you had to have some level of definiteness of terms, the lack of which would mean that the parties at best were engaging in preliminary negotiations. But there's not yet enough on the table from an offeror perspective for there to be the acceptance by an offeree. The example is, I'll sell you something for some amount of money someday in the future. What does that mean? Okay, I'll sell you one of my three cars. I don't know which one yet. And I'm not sure of the price yet. Okay, all of those, both of those really, are lacking in definiteness. When we talk about the definiteness or third component of acceptance, we use different terminology. It's the same basic idea, but it is a little bit more complicated. We don't say sufficiently definite. We say either of two things, basically. One is responsive, and that is the secret one, or the, that's the secret weapon. That is the big one to use now. The other is mirror image. Okay, and let me explain briefly again. We covered it last time, but just briefly. Uh, in the olden days, or even today, if the offeror demands acceptance in a very particular way, the acceptance must come back in the mirror image. It must be exactly the same as the offer requires. Okay? And that's the concept of the mirror image rule. Small differences would be enough in the old days to be a rejection. Small differences today probably are not a big deal, do not lead to rejections, and therefore they are responsive. It depends in large part on how big of a deal a certain item is in the uh, our first mind. For example, uh, if I say, let me know by Friday, and you send an email, well, emails are uh, my preferred uh, form of communication now. But I could pretend and say, oh, you didn't mail it to me, you would written in blood. Ha ha, you didn't accept on time, and I can sell it for double to my, your friend down the street. Well, that would be ridiculous. Okay? If I said, however, you have to sign while standing on your head, and it needs to be witnessed with three witnesses who sign affidavits, that has how it has to be done. It's ridiculous. But the, the offeror is the master of the offer, and he or she can demand how acceptance is manifested, and that would be mirror image rule. But most of the time, close enough about what the offeror expects because it's not really specified, it's good enough. And that's why we say responsive. Okay, so with the offer, it has to have enough definiteness of terms. For the acceptance, it's got to be responsive. This is the third component. Or in certain cases, like in the old days, or now if the offeror is very clear on the parameters of acceptance, you can use not responsive but mirror image rule. You can require a mirror, mirror image rule of exact acceptance rather than something that is merely responsive. Okay? 
uh, a big part of today's material is the communication aspect. Uh, as noted a minute ago, if the offeror wants the acceptance to be communicated in a particular way, it has to be communicated in that way. If the offeror does not specify exactly how the acceptance must reach the offeror, the law applies a default rule, which can be changed if the parties choose. But the default, we call it the mailbox rule. Some level of certainty on the moment of acceptance. And so if the parties don't provide otherwise, the general rule is when a party puts the acceptance, when the offeree puts the acceptance out of his or her or its control, dispatch, properly dispatched, that acts as, as an acceptance at that moment, even though it has not yet reached the knowledge of the hand of the offeror. Okay, and that's the general default rule if it's not changed otherwise. And it's called the mailbox rule because in the old days, most acceptances were, most deals were done through the mail. And so someone would send an offer, someone would write back the acceptance and would go in the mail. And if there was a proper stamp and a proper address, when the offeree took that letter, properly stamped and addressed, and put it out of his or her hands, the acceptance was effective on that moment, and the offeror could not call back and try to revoke. Okay? That is the general rule. Uh, uh, offerees, the acceptance is effective on dispatch. That's the mailbox rule. And don't forget, today it might be the email rule. When you type an email, it's not yet gone. When you click send and can't get it back, now you probably have an acceptance. So we could have the email click send rule today, but you can still just call it the mailbox rule because you understand it doesn't necessarily now have to be via the U.S. mail. It could be by fax, could be by email. Okay? Um, okay. We'll learn a little bit more about this in several classes, but again, if the offeror expects an acceptance by a certain way, it has to be done that way, and the mailbox rule will not apply because it is only a default rule. For example, offeree, I don't care how you send it. You can email it. You can mail it. You can tie it to a pigeon's little foot with a little thread and send it to me. I don't care how. But it is not effective, and I can revoke it or sell to somebody else, revo thereby revoking, anytime I want to, until your acceptance touches this hand. When it reaches my business, when it's in my hand, when I open it and read it, until then, no acceptance. That's basically requiring the mirror image rule, isn't it? But an offeror can't expect it that way. Also, an option contract. Think of it this way. There might be a, a, a contract for me to sell you my motorcycle for $5,000, if I had one. I don't. But if I did, and I was selling it to you for $500, you may need time to think about it. But it's a good deal, and you want me to wait and not offer it to anyone else. So there's a contract for me to sell you the motorcycle for $5,000. You want a second contract related, which is time to accept, the exclusive right to accept. In other words, will you give me three days to think about it and not sell to anyone else? That is a second contract. So there's the underlying contract for the thing that being done, then there's the option contract, buying somebody time so no one else can accept yet. Give me three more days, I have to check my finances. I would be asking for an option contract. And we, there are several areas of formation law where the option contract becomes relatively important because what it does is it prevents the ability of an offeror to revoke an offer or to sell to someone else for a certain period of time. Uh, there are several big issues, including one that will pick up, I believe, in week five or class five, uh, with regard to um, option contracts formed by performance in the context of a unilateral offer, a unilateral contract situation. Uh, maybe put that on your radar screens. You won't understand it yet, perhaps, but we will come back and we will talk about that. Okay? Another very big thing about today's material. Uh, the offeree has the right to accept, to hear, to communicate responsively, while the offer is still open. But the offer can be closed. And there are several ways. There's a, there's a very good restatement that lists good ways, and you can use that in your outline. The offer or could revoke it. Before you accept it, before you put your acceptance in the mail, I call you and say, 
offer's over. I sold it to somebody else. I win. You lose. Okay? I've revoked it in time before acceptance. Another thing to think about, lapse of time. I might say you have to let me know by Friday. And if you put the thing in the mail or you call me Saturday, it is too late. The offer has lapsed. Okay? There are some offers that are real time. The minute I walk out the door, it is treated as lapsed based on the facts and circumstances. I, uh, you could reject it and say, no, I can't buy a motorcycle. I, I, they're, they're, they're unsafe. I will not buy. Then it's rejected. You can't come back later and say, oh, I changed my mind. Please, it was a great price. Too late, you rejected it. You can come back to me and make your own offer to me, switching you now as offeror and me. I made an offer to sell. You reject it, but you come back later, you can make an offer to purchase it. Okay? And in fact, multiple choice test takers may want to keep that in mind. You could make a counter offer as an offeree. Uh, I love it, but 4500 is my best price. That's a rejection of my offer, but yours becomes the offer at $4,500. Okay? Uh, the death of either, the offeror or offeree, revokes an offer. It's gone. You can't accept it. Uh, note to self, yourself, if the contract has already been formed, the death of either party doesn't change anything. The estate of the decedent can honor the contract, whether it's a purchase or a sale. Okay? But if it's an offer, the death of either revokes it. Um, back to option contracts very briefly. It's that second contract buying someone time for the exclusive right to accept an offer. Uh, the common law recognizes them. Uh, they can be created expressly. Will you give me three days? Okay, that's one way. Uh, they can be created uh, as the, uh, there, there's a way they can be created via promissory estoppel, which we will get into at another time. So park the option contract by promissory estoppel. I think that we cover it uh, a little bit in week three, but we'll cover it for sure in the next few weeks. Uh, there's a UCC Article 2, and that's Florida uh, Statutory Section 672, okay, Chapter 672, provision called the firm offer. The firm offer is option contract, and it's a, it's, it works the same way as in a common law option contract with a slight difference. I could say, well, I'll paint your house for $1,000. You could say, could you give me three days to think about it? Here's a beer for the three days grace before I have to accept. But you hold it open that long, right? You have the two agreements. The consideration for painting is $1,000. The consideration for three days to think about it is that beer. Okay? Uh, firm offers are the same thing. Okay? And, but they have elements. It must be made by a merchant. If a merchant puts in writing that he, she, or it will leave a contract open exclusively to the ability of the offeree to accept, it does not need its own consideration. It's already in writing. But it also has to be made by a merchant, not a non-merchant. So it's not just sale of goods, but it's also being made by a merchant, and it's in writing. And it stays open for as long as the writing says it stays open, or for a reasonable time under the facts and circumstances if the exact date is not specified. Okay? Um, with regard to firm offers, because they're option contracts, they don't fall under the mailbox rule. Okay? A second interesting thing about the firm offer of 672.205 under the Florida statutes, which is the Florida embodiment of UCC 2-205. Uh, if it's in writing, made by a merchant, it does not need separate consideration, which is something that we require in Class 5. One last thing to remind. The mailbox rule applies as a default. In the case of option contracts, where there's a certain amount of time that the offeree has exclusively, in which to accept or reject, and no one else has the right to do anything in between until that period is over, uh, those, by definition, fall outside of the mailbox rule. And therefore, if it is an acceptance of an option contract, that needs to be in the hand, not just put in the mail. Okay? I look forward to discussing Class 4 in about one week.